That's a lot of questions. Maybe he has a lot that he wants us to understand. A lot that he wants us to under, understand and retain. Well, here's a few of those questions. Here's one of them. Remember when the disciples were out in the ocean, out at the sea, and asked Peter, to, or Peter says, let me walk on water to you, that's really you. Let me walk out to sea, and Peter stepped out on faith and began to walk on that water, and then Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, and what happened to him? He began to sink. And Jesus looked down at him and says, why did you doubt? One of the questions Christ asked. Christians, how many times has Christ asked you that question? Why do you still doubt? How many believe He's our King this morning? Yeah. How many believe He's our Messiah this morning? Yeah. He is our promised one. He's the one coming back for us. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. He's the one who died for the forgiveness of our sins. And He's the one that totally wiped away all of our sins of all mankind if we truly believe in His only begotten Son. <clears throat> Remember that story about Christ? He just had fed the 5,000. That's just men. Not counting all you hungry ladies and women and kids. So you've had all those 5,000. The next day, they're following after Jesus. And then Jesus stopped and looked at them and says, basically, why are you still following me? They just fed all those thousands of bellies. The next day, they're following him. And Jesus says, unless you eat of this bread and you drink of my blood, you will have no part in the kingdom. Speaking about how he must die. And it says that day, the fastest church that grew overnight, the fastest church, split up that quickly. Can you imagine losing 5,000 members in one day? That church did. It says that all that huge crowd that followed Jesus left him. And there was the disciples only with him. And Jesus asked this question, are you also going to leave me? You also gonna leave. When times get tough, Christ will ask, Christ will ask you that question. Remember when Peter denied Jesus? And after Jesus rose from the grave, he asked Peter a series of three questions the exact same way. He says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And a third time he says, Peter, do you love me? I want to ask you the same question this morning. Christ asking every single one of you this morning the same exact question. Do you still love Jesus? I'm going to ask again. Do you still love Jesus? He's going to ask a third time. Do you still love Jesus? The first time Peter says, yes, I love you like a friend. The second time Peter says, yes, I love you like a friend. And that third time Jesus says, do you love me? And he responded back, Jesus, why do you keep asking me? This time he says, I truly agape love you. It means I love you under all circumstances. No matter what the devil may throw at me, no matter what I may go through, I will always love you. Then he asked this question. He says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul? How many has a car you rode to work, I rode to church here in? We rode a horse and buggy. Anybody rode, rode a car, amen? How many has a home to go home to after a while? At least you left your stove home. It's not there when you get there. How many have a job to go to next week? Our family. But the most important question, how many have a heaven to go to yes. after this life yeah. is over? Hallelujah. All this material things will pass away. All our homes and all of our jobs. You understand that the job you have now, as soon as you die, somebody's put that exact same posting, they're advertising a brand new job, new opening. We're indispensable. But our home in heaven is one we need to prepare for. We lay up treasures there, because that's where our heart, our treasure ought to be. How about this question? And the one we often have so much problems with dealing with the questions of Christ, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do as I say? Christ is our King, amen. Yes. amen. Christ is our Lord, amen. amen. The one we not do as He says. There's one question we'll look at today, only one question. And this is one of these questions that I believe I call this one the forgotten question of the Scripture. Because this is one of the very last questions that He asks us, not just the ones in His time, but this is a futuristic question. 
He is asking this question to the generation that will be alive when he comes back. I don't know about you, but I'm that generation. Do you believe it? Amen. I believe he'll come back any day now. There's no precursor. He just says to be a great falling away. That's already happened. He said ungodliness will continue. He said the love of many will wax cold. And there will be a complete turnaround where they accept wickedness for good and call good evil and evil good. We're not living in that situation today. Amen. That's this generation. But he could come back any day now. Here's the question he gave us. He posed it in the form of a parable. Parable means simply that he sent, spoke this to help Mac, for us to recreate in our head to bring out a very spiritual point. So here's chapter 18, starting with verse number 1. Then Jesus spoke a parable of them that men always ought to pray and not what? Not lose heart. So what's this parable about? This parable is to teach us no matter what we may face in our life, we're not to stop praying and not to lose heart. Lose heart means don't give up. We're glad we still serve. We still serve a powerful God. Saying there was in a certain city a judge. Say governor. That's what a judge is, right? There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God. Praise the Lord. Not that, 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 that is not us, right? There is a government who did not fear guard God, nor regard man. That word regard in the Greek means he is not ashamed of anything. He's a corrupt judge. He is a sinful judge, and he does not fear the way he lives, and there is no shame about what he does. He brags about it. He's happy to live in the sin he does. Don't even make excuses for it. Just say, this is the way it is. I'm not ashamed. Now, there was a widow in that city, and she came to this judge saying, get justice for me, <clears throat> for my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within, within himself, though I do not fear God, God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her. Lest by her continually coming, she weary me. So what's happening here? This widow could not speak but for herself. She has no husband. She has no kids to speak for. Back in this day, women, you cannot go to court unless you had no one to speak for you. And this lady's going before this judge saying, please, someone has taken something from me. Please defend me. Please pass judgment. And first she says no. But every day she kept coming back saying, please, you have to hear my case. You have to take you have to give a judgment. You have to help me. And day after day after day, she before a judge. And finally, the judge says, Fine, I will pass judgment just so you will keep quiet. <clears throat> it goes on and says in verse 6 Then Jesus said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And how shall God not avenge his own elect? who cry out day and night to Him, though He bears long with them. What He's saying is this. We know we live in a tough situation in here. We live in a very tough world, full of sin and full of violence. And we always ask God, why is this stuff happening? Why is the... It seems like the wickedness is always prevailing. Why does it seem like the good guys never win? <clears throat> he says that the, the wicked judge will avenge those how much more will God avenge those that are elect? How much more will God defend those who He has chosen as only sons and daughters? And he asks this question. I tell you that He will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will He really find faith on the earth. 
one of the very last questions our Savior asked. Speaking of that generation in which He comes back during. So He's speaking to us in this generation that I believe could come back any day. And He's asking that when the Son of Man comes back, will He actually find anybody that still has faith anymore? This word faith is a two-part. The word, this word first means faith. Like I believe, I serve, I hold on to it, I'm dedicated to that fact. The second one means I'm faithful. How many of you are faithful? How many of you are faithful to your job? How many of you are faithful to your husband? You better be. Or your wife? You better be. If you're not, the altar is available this morning. Amen? How many of you are faithful to your kids to make sure your children have food and clothing on their backs? How many of you are faithful to your friends and to your family? How many are faithful to the church? More importantly, how many are faithful to Jesus? <clears throat> Being faithful to a church is only because you're faithful to Jesus. If you're not faithful to Him first, you'll be faithful to this. This is where we come and celebrate the fact that He died and rose again for us. The fact that He's coming again for us. I'll show you a couple of verses. Every single one, the Bible tells us, every single one of us has been given a certain amount of faith. you believe that? Amen. Yeah. Every one of us. Every bit of us has a amount of faith placed in every single one of us. Now here's where we should raise your hands and be happy. How many of y'all know that a shadow of a doubt you're going to heaven? Keep my hands up. <clears throat> How many know the Holy Spirit lives inside of you? I don't never say it. The Bible tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is. So imagine a gigantic tree. And we know an apple tree has one kind of fruit, right? What's that fruit? Somebody said oranges. Who said that? <laughs> an apple tree produces apple juice. Banana tree, bananas. But we being from that vine, we being the true vine, we are able to produce because of the Spirit inside of us, we produce nine fruit. Not nine fruits at different times, but we know if someone walks up our figurative tree, they ought to find nine different kinds of fruit hanging from that tree. Here's what Galatians says those fruits are. If you have the Holy Spirit, you do not have these fruit. Two things. Number one, you're a false believer. Or number two, you're a dead believer. Your faith is dried up. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love. If you don't have love, first of all, you don't have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have joy, you do not have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have peace, you don't have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have patience, say, oh me. <laughs> Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. This is one of the fruits of the Spirit is that God tells us with the Holy Spirit inside of us, we have to be faithful. Gentleness, you mean people. Gentleness. Self-control. Against such, there is no law. This past week I found another verse about our faith. And I like the way this verse, this paraphrased version, Called the message. Here's the way it reads. Second Corinthians says this. Test yourselves to make sure you are solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourself regularly checkups. How many of the doctors once a year? Nobody? <laughs> Twice a year. And the older you get, the more painful it gets, don't it? They check everything. Hand to toe. Check everything. And here's God's Word telling us the same is true for your physical life. Just because you're spiritual life. Just because you're physical life, you go to the doctor twice a year or once a year. You're constantly the doctor check you out to see what is wrong. 
The same thing is true of your spiritual life. Give yourself regular checkups. You need first-hand evidence, not mere hearsay. Well, the preacher said I was saved. My name's on that book in the church. I know I got baptized there. I know, well, well, I know. That's what I told me. Mama said I was saved, and Mama's always right. <laughs> now listen to hearsay that Jesus Christ is in you. Test it out. If you fail the test, do something about it. So if you don't have love and gentleness and patience and kindness and faithfulness, examine what fruit is missing and do something about it. I mean, love your children. Don't lie. <laughs> I'm going to say it. The little me out there is passed out. See here? Not out. If right now, if right now she stopped breathing, praise God, she's not going to happen. But if it did, and her mom would just sit there holding her, saying, no big deal, no big deal, how would you all think? If you know something is dead and you do nothing about it, there's a huge problem. If you look at your life and see that you're missing your joy, or you're missing your faithfulness or your gentleness, and you do absolutely nothing about it, it's like holding that small child and doing nothing about something dead in your arms. Hebrews 11 tells us this, that it is impossible without faith to please Him. For the one who comes to God must believe that He exists and that He proves to be the one who rewards those who speak Him. i got 20 minutes, y'all ready? they got plenty of time. The next few minutes I want to describe to you seven types of faith that I've been able to see in my life. And if you can examine these seven types of faith, I want you to scream out which one you have. Okay? Some of you may have one some may have two or three. Some may have them all. If you have all of them, you come to the altar and get saved. But here's the first faith that is exhibited. When Christ says that in verse 8, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will He really find faith on the earth? These are the seven types of faith, I believe, that will be on the earth when Christ comes back. Here's our first one. I believe what I call damaged faith. Damaged faith. You ever been hurt before by those you love? Remember that very first boyfriend or girlfriend you had in kindergarten? <laughs> Don't lie. You know their names. You never forget your first love, your first little crush. You never forget. My first little crush in kindergarten. She was adorable. Just the sweetest to me. And I always told myself, that's going to be my little wife. We used to kiss on the bus every day. <laughs> I seen her the other day and I said, ooh, thank God I didn't marry this way. <laughs> but, ah, she broke my heart in kindergarten, you know. She broke it. She says, I don't want to kiss you no more. It hurt. Speaking of that, this past week I got Tiffany to school. And if many of you know how Tiffany is, she likes to say kiss, and she give me a kiss on the cheek. And at home, she always says, Daddy, can I get a kiss from you? And I always give her a little kiss on the cheek. And especially going to school in the morning, she always says, Bye, Daddy, love you, kisses. And we give each other kisses on the cheek. It's been the routine for 11 years. Well, last week she had a birthday. Week before that, she had a birthday. She's 11, getting old. And this past week, I dropped her off at school. And I said, Bob, any kisses? And she goes, no. <laughs> Not in front of my friends, Daddy. It broke my heart. I wouldn't, now you think I'm lying, I wouldn't even hold and cry. You weak preacher? Yes, I am. My baby would not kiss her daddy. I was sad. Some of you have experienced that. You ain't even had that broken heart. You just don't want to admit it. You mean I'm going to cry too, to be honest. Y'all went home and got on the covers and just cried because baby wouldn't give you a kiss. It hurts. The kids are growing up and they don't need you as much. Broke my heart. See, because humans have a way of hurting us, don't we? Humans have a way of sticking that knife into 
to us and turn a little bit on it. We've been hurt by a human situation. We've been hurt before. And somehow we relay that to God. <clears throat> Is that we know humans have let us down. Our friends have let us down. Our families let us down. Our husband, our wife has let us down. Tiffany let me down. <laughs> so now we think that Almighty God will let us down. And we take that human condition and say, everybody else has failed me. Why not God? Another word for damaged is doubting. That doubting faith. Well, I'm going to pray. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to hopefully hold out hope that God may do something. That's doubting faith. Here's another one. I call this one what I call my wife. Dinky. <laughs> Dinky faith. Dinky means little. So it's not a bad word. And would you all admit, she, if you ask her, or ask me, she is four from eleven. You ask her, she's four from eleven and seven eighths. Well, that means that means absolutely nothing. But her opinion, she she rounds up to the nearest whole number, and so she's five foot according to her. But she's little. Little. Her last name used to be Whittle, believe it or not. <laughs> and rely on that one. Her name's Dinky. Dinky must have been And she always answers, Dinky. Dinky means little. But throughout Scripture, did Christ at least five or six times, maybe in the book of Matthew, ask the disciples, O oh, ye of Dinky faith? <laughs> Did not he? Here's one. Matthew 6 30. Jesus asked, it's not here, it's in your Bible zone. Matthew 6 30, the disciples were worried about food and clothing and shelter. And Jesus says, Does not the Father take care of the lilies of the valley? Does not take care of the ravens and feed those? Knowing that God loves you so much more than those things, why do you doubt? Oh, you little faith. Remember in 8, 26 of Matthew, the disciples were on the boat. And Jesus is in the bow of the boat. And what's he doing? He's pulling a meal right now, just fast asleep. Knocked out, fast asleep. And that's a great storm come up. And they go wake up Jesus and says, Jesus, help us, we're about to sing. And what did Jesus say? Oh ye of dinky faith. <laughs> You have Christ in the boat with you and you're worried about drowning. Christians, you have the very Spirit of God living inside of you and you're worried how tomorrow's going to behave. Amen. Why is it that the, the disciples knew that we had the exact same problem, but the very Spirit of God lives inside of us. He is right there, so I can speak to Him any day, any time, anywhere I go. He's always there. Never leave me. Never forsake me. We get a doubt. And oh, me of dinky faith. Matthew 14. Yet again, as Peter's walking on the water, he looks, he takes his eyes off of Jesus. Right there, Christ is with him. He looks away from Jesus and begins to sink. Greet Jesus grabs him and says, Why are you doubting? Oh, ye of dinky faith. Matthew 16. Jesus just fed the 4,000 and just fed the 5,000. And all of a sudden the Pharisees and Sadducees come to Jesus and begin to question Him. And so Jesus and the disciples went away for a few days and when they got to the other side of the river they sighted, they forgot their bread. And here are the disciples saying, Oh no, which one of y'all forgot to bring the bread? We're going to starve. We need food. And Jesus says, I just fed 5,000 with a few loaves and a few fishes. I just fed four more thousand with even less. And here you are wondering, how am I going to feed you? Oh, ye of dinky faith. Do not forget where Christ is at right now. You know where he's at? Can he ever leave you? Can he ever forsake you? He knows his promises. So why do we have that dinky faith knowing Christ takes care of the birds and the field and the lilies and takes care of all those who need to be fed? And takes care of all his new shelter and all their basic needs, and somehow think that Christ is not taking care of yours. Here's the third one. So yet again, let's back it really quick. Here's the first two. Damage, you might got damaged faith. 
If I got some dinky faith, if I got any dead faith, dead faith. James tells us all about dead faith, the brother of Jesus. And he says, if you say I have faith, faith without works is what? Yeah. Say it again. Those who love Jesus, and there's no external evidence of your love for Jesus, what does that make your faith? Yeah. Now, are we saved by our works? No. But our works are evidence of our salvation. When I first came to this church about 22 years ago, <laughs> feels like it be five years in January. That's a long time. Five years. But me and Miss Connie and Miss Margaret and Brother George Dewey sat in that office back there and they interviewed me. They were strict to y'all. Mean. Mean. <laughs> Lay it low at the boom now. And I asked them how I felt about certain things and how I believed, and I told them how I believed, and asked them how they believed. And one question I asked them, I always think I told them. See, I'm the kind of preacher, and for five years I've been very diligent about this. I will never beg a born again child of God to come to church. I will never beg someone. Please, God loves you. I know you love Him, so you need to come show God you love Him. I'll never do that. But those who are not faithful to church, first, are not faithful to Jesus. If they're not faithful to Christ, it means they're probably not saved to begin with. Our job is not to encourage Christians to come to church or encourage Christians to live holy. We're not to encourage Christians to keep telling them, you know, God says don't do this. They know that. They know our job is to preach the good news and tell them exactly what's happened to those who refuse to repent. But faith without works. I always think it's kind of bad to motivate a Christian to do something the Holy Spirit already told them to do. Because your faith without your works is dead. If you have no joy, happiness, peace, love, and kindness that comes out of your relationship with Jesus, you have a <coughs> Me. You might say me. Oh, this one. Move right along. When Christ comes back, you also find demonic faith. Well, look at your spouse and say, that's you. <laughs> demonic. Don't say that really. If you really said that, don't really say it. You know what demonic faith is? John James also tells us. It says that even the demons believe Jesus rose from the grave. Well, I believe Jesus rose from the grave. Well, good. That makes you no better than a demon. Congratulations. Well, I believe He died on the cross. Well, so do they. You believe the devil can quote more scripture than you can? <laughs> I believe the devil knows the Bible frontwards and backwards. He knows it better than we do. He even knows how the book ends. He just don't want to believe it. Because in the end, he's going to be totally annihilated. And none of it never to bring that curse <coughs> back. But not only does it say that the demons believe, but the Bible says the demons believe and they shudder. You know what shudder means? Shudder means they tremble in terror thinking about it. But we have Christians today that open their Bibles all week long. Some Christians have not prayed all week long. Some Christians who claim the name of Jesus have been in church in months. But a demon will tremble out of faith. The Christians stand up holy and burnly and say, I'm just fine. Also, demonic faith is one that always tries to discourage anything that is trying to build your spirituality up. I want to sing a song. Rick, Rick, you can't sing. I'm not singing for you, brother. I know I'll sing you a love song. I want to sing a love song to my wife and to Jesus. I'm not going to sing anything else to y'all. I love y'all. I really do. But I'm not, I'm not in love with y'all. 
with me? I'm in love with just Jesus. And my favorite Gomer Powell episode is. I like it. I don't love it. When I can, no, I'm just kidding. Gomer Powell jumped in my head for some reason. Look at Brother Jeffrey over there. <laughs> Here's the fifth one. Displaced faith. This is where you put your faith in the wrong things. This comment brought us up a few Sunday mornings ago in Sunday school. But how many of you got in your car this morning and had faith in your car would crank up? Are you sitting down on that bench? This bench is probably about like 40 years old, maybe. And with a 40 year old bench, gonna hold you. He told you up. After all that pie you ate last night, you had faith gonna hold you up. You had faith that AC may work or not work. So you prayed it wouldn't work today, right? You had faith that you're gonna have dinner this afternoon. Displaced faith means you have faith in the wrong things. Some of you have faith in the next politician. Displaced faith. I worship the king. I know the king in charge of them to be okay, right? Amen. As long as he's up there, I don't care who's up there. As long as he's on the throne, I don't care who's in the White House. I know he's on the throne. My faith. Here's number six kind of faith. It's called dynamic faith. You know what dynamic means? In Acts chapter 1, verses 8, the Bible says that when the Holy Spirit comes upon His disciples, Christ's disciples, they will be given dynamos power. We get our word dynamite from. Dynamite goes boom. Dynamite's loud. It hears it around. It's earth shaking. It makes mountains move. That's the kind of faith we're to have. This past week I got to sit down with a few of my co-workers. It's me out here last Sunday up to hear the message about that we only have one battle in this world. Our battle is against the enemy, right? Not against each other, but against the enemy being the devil. And the only biblically approved weapon we have is this one. That's right. That's it. The only thing we have to fight against the devil is the God's Word. Nothing else. That's the only thing he biblically approved. This past week, God said, ha ha, time to practice what to preach. It's one thing to say, do as I say. Don't do as I do. Do as I say, right? This past week, I got to sit down with a few colleagues. And somehow, ironically, I don't know how, we get on the, the topic of transgender. We're a very enlightened bunch of people. Those police officers, you know. What I mean? So we're sitting around there talking about this, and a couple of guys saying, I don't care what they are. As long as they don't bother me, I don't care what they are. And one of them says, well, I ain't got a problem with it. People have the right to choose what they want to be or don't want to be. they got the right. That's the thing about living in democracy. We have the right to be whatever we want to be. I'm going to be a bird. I'm going to be a bird. I'm going to be a cat. I'm going to be a cat. I'm going to be a cat. I'm going to be whatever I want to be. And then they say, well, how do you feel about it? And last week, y'all, I did again. I had to practice what I preach because I forgot I had my Bible in my hand. I pulled up Google right then. Typed in Bible. Found a Bible scriptory, which wasn't always used. And I said, the Bible says that God made man and woman in his image. In the image of God, he made both man and woman. And God blessed them. Therefore, anything other than them is wrong. Guess what they did? They shut up. <laughs> Amen. When the devil, when Jesus quoted the scripture to the devil, what did the devil do? He shut his mouth and fled. I got some good co workers. I'm not making fun of that. And my, my battle is not with them. My battle is with principalities and powers and all those schemes of the devil and lies of the devil. We're supposed to stand up against that. Dynamic faith. And not only is it dynamic, a person, when the same group comes to me after it got done and says, you know, I never thought of it like that. Because dynamite power also impacts my beside you. And here's our last time. The one we all better have. I want you to have dynamite power, 100%. I want you to want, also want you to have this one. Delivering faith. Delivering faith. 
Because he does say this in verses 8, the same verse. <laughs> Nevertheless, when in the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now, this coming here in this verse is not talking about a rapture. This verse is described as the second coming of Jesus. And when Jesus comes back after that seven year tribulation on earth, that's when he's asking, Will I really find any faith on the earth? One reason you won't find much is because during that seven year tribulation, if you invite the Lord into your life, it's a death warrant. You'll be killed for your faith in Jesus. So don't many people alive when Jesus comes back full of faith. But here's what delivering faith is. Here's the faith I want you to have. Here's what 1 Thessalonians tells us. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout. I still believe this. I have faith in this. With the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who remain, will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Notice we meet Him on the earth. He didn't come back to the earth. We met him in the halfway. And so we will forever, always be the Lord. Here's our delivering faith. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. Because Jesus is coming back. And he wants to be full of faith. When he comes back this, this time here in this verse, he's only taking those who have the true faith. He's only coming back for those who have remained faithful, who is without spot, without blemish. Those who says, you are my king and I'm faithful to the very end. This is a delivering faith. And the question is for all of us today, which one of these be a part of? When he comes back as delivering faith, or when he comes back and says, is there really going to be any faith on earth? my second time.